Thank you everybody for uh, joining. This is our second meetup uh, in Romania Power BI and Modern Excel user group. And uh, today we have the honor to to have Marco as a as a guest in uh, in our show. Uh, let's go through quickly through the uh, few slides, few introductory slides uh, with the high level agenda. We are on the first section now with the welcoming and the overview. Uh, we'll go quickly on the next meetups and events that uh, I think it's important to show to everybody. And then we'll go directly to the main session for today, the main Q&A session with uh, Marco. And then in the end, a few minutes for wrap up and uh, this is it. So uh, without uh, further further ado, uh, one thing just to make sure that uh, everybody is uh, following these guidelines to help with the internet connection performance. Uh, please make sure that during the session your microphone is muted and the video is turned off. Uh, please type your questions uh, or comments in the chat area and uh, prefix your questions with a queue so we can spot them uh, easier. If you really want to speak and uh, say something important, please raise your hand to indicate that uh, you want to do it. And uh, if you have problems with the internet connection, please drop off and uh, join again. No worries, uh, Teams is recording everything and uh, you can uh, see what you've missed until you reboot it. Uh, and speaking of recording, this meeting is recording and uh, is recorded and will be shared, uploaded on uh, YouTube probably in two days. Uh, few things about our next uh, meetups. Our uh, next one will be on the 29th of April and uh, we have it. Uh, we have as a guest, uh, Matt Ellington is coming as our guest. Uh, he provided us some uh, options for the session that uh, he can come with us. So in a few days, I will uh, send a form to everybody who's a member of the Romania Power BI user, we, user group with uh, these three options uh, of uh, sessions that uh, you would like to see uh, from Matt. And then on uh, the 27th of May, Reza Rad will, uh, will be our guest. And uh, he will do a session on uh, Power Query and data flows probably. It's not 100% uh, decided, but uh, this is uh, what we would like to, to have presented. And uh, speaking of Reza, just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody knows about his uh, event that he's organizing during uh, April. There's a week of, uh, uh, I don't know, pure gold Power BI uh, in the Power BI Summit, which is a multi-day event bringing speakers from the Microsoft Power BI teams, product group and community experts and MVPs from all around the world. The conference uh, it's run virtually and you can attend from anywhere. All you need is an internet connection and a computer. There are more than 100 speakers and sessions at this conference and uh, there are, I don't think there is any topic uh, related to Power BI that it's not covered there. The conference uh, it's a good opportunity to learn and network online uh and uh, you're only invited because i thought it's a very good uh, opportunity here to tell everybody about it and uh, by the way i think there are two or three more days of uh, early bird price anyway the price is not high but uh, you can still have a discount if you are registering today tomorrow something like this until the 28th i think uh, now that we've gone through uh, the beginning slides, we should focus on our session today. And uh, we are having Marco uh, as a 
as a feature speaker. Uh, he'll be doing the uh, Q&A session around one hour, more or less, depending on uh, how many questions do we have. He agreed that uh, if we still have questions that uh, need to be answered, uh, he can stay a bit more and uh, qu uh, take every question and answer it. Uh, I think everybody who, who joined the uh, today meeting uh, know who Marco is. Uh, I took several courses delivered by Marco and Alberto, and uh, they are the go to resource when uh, learning DACs and uh, data modeling. Uh, Marco, we never met in person. I've only met uh, Alberto. Alberto. In, yeah. Uh, yeah, in London back in yes. 2016 when uh, I took the Mastering DAX course. Uh, I've learned a lot from SQL BI, both from you and Marco, and uh, I'm sure exactly. that uh, the entire content that uh, you are delivering and will be delivering uh, from now on uh, will be helpful. Uh, I'm surprised every week that I still find old videos, old meaning, <laughs> that, uh, uh, even from 2013, 2014, with uh, you and Alberto in different conferences yeah. on different yeah. topics like, uh, I don't know, many to many relationships and uh, things like this that uh, uh, are still available online and uh, they are new to me. So uh, I'm learning every day. Thank you again for accepting to be our uh, guest. It's a great honor for us and uh, uh, the stage is yours at the beginning. Okay. Thank, uh, you. Just Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Maybe okay. a small presentation and then uh, we can go with the first question. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm glad to be here. I know that you are in the first, uh, no, this is the second uh, user group meeting. So I hope your community will grow in the next few months and year. And certainly you start uh, with Thank a lot you. of uh, many, many, you know, very well known speaker. I would not say important because I'm not important, but. <laughs> Certainly, uh, are, uh, many people you, know know me, so I cannot say because I <laughs> my my presence on the web is you know very very dense. If you look for DAX, of course. So, just to introduce the session, we produced a session that we provided through YouTube through a dedicated link, where I presented uh, a session about what to do when you find some performance issue in Power BI, what are the first steps to, to do? Uh, I hope that you watch the session, but even though you didn't watch entirely the session, the questions are, you know, are mainly focused on, those, uh, on, on that content, even though if there are additional questions, we have time, we can reply, but we will give priority to the questions about performances in Power BI, in DAX, uh, the tools I use, DAX Studio, VertiPack Analyzer, and so on. Um, I think that's it. If you have some question to start, then you can write in the chat window and Christian will help me looking at the questions and you know moving to the questions uh, producing in the chat. We have a few questions we already received. We start from there, but don't be shy. Write the questions in the in the in the chat window. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. The first question is from uh, Renato Lira. Yes. Uh, should so, I read it or you will read it? Uh, I I can I can read it so I can already okay. because there are several questions so it's better if I if I split the, the the answers. So the first question is about how long does the cache persist in a regular model without Role of security, can it be shared among other users? Okay, yes. So first, the the cache in Power BI or in analysis services, which is the engine that is used by Power BI, is um uh, okay, let's talk about Vertipack. So we I, I will switch to my whiteboard. Let me just Share so it's easier if I use uh, the. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. So we basically have this situation. So let's say this is Power BI. Okay. 
Power BI has a report and generates DAX code. Within the DAX, the, the DAX code that is generated is um, sent to the analysis services engine, right? This is internal to Power BI Desktop, but this is also available when you connect to the Power BI service or to Azure Analysis Services. Here, within the Analysis Services Engine, you have two elements, what we call the Formula Engine and what we call the Storage Engine, okay? Formula Engine, Storage Engine, what does it mean? The, the DAX query, so let's say that the report here, uh, you have a visual here. The visual generates a DAX query. The DAX query is sent to the analysis services engine that is and is parsed by the formula engine. The formula engine calls the storage engine. Now, what happens at this point? First, Power BI has a cache at the visual level. What does it mean? If you switch between different slicers, and you go back to a combination of filters that you already used a few minutes ago, the query is not sent to the engine. The query is reused, reusing the result of a previous query with the same combination of slicers and filters. So let's ignore that query. That is the query of the report. The engine, so if, if I run the same DAX query twice, there is no cache at the formula engine level, which means that the formula engine will repeat the calculation all the times. So the formula engine has to request data to the storage engine because the formula engine is only the calculation engine, but in order to read the data the, and, and perform the aggregation over rows, there is a query sent to the storage engine. The storage engine could be an external one, direct query. Let's talk just about Vertibac, the engine that you use when you import the data. Now, the storage engine has a cache. So the storage engine, whenever you generate, uh, so whenever the formula engine send a request to the storage engine, the storage engine replies with a result that we call data cache. The data cache is the only cache you have for uh, DAX queries because MDX queries are different, but DAX query only have the, store, the, 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 the data cache, which is a storage engine cache. Now, how long this cache is kept in memory? It depends. It could be a few milliseconds or a few hours. The only thing that matters is the following. There is a list. Imagine that you have slots here and the storage engine, so the first query, is stored here. The second query is stored here. And this list of queries uh, is limited by the version that you have because older versions had a very short list. Newer version have a longer list, but when I say long, no more than 256 or 512 per database. Per database means that when you use Power BI Desktop, you are the only user. But when you use Power BI service, the architecture is the same, and this cache is shared across all the users, which means that mainly this cache is used for a single report, because a single report could send multiple DAX queries, and every DAX query could send multiple storage engine requests. But because a single query could repeat similar requests or the same request, uh, or when you simply Click on a slicer, could be that several requests are the same. So the idea is that the storage engine only keep the last few queries. By time, there is no statistics about what are the more used ones or something like that, nothing complex, because the principle is that the storage engine is so fast that requesting the same, um, sorry, managing a too long list of cached data would be more expensive than simply execute the query. Of course, it's not always true, and there could be a number of situations where this management of the cache is far from ideal, I know, but this is how it works. So if I go back to, so let me stop sharing. If I remember, can you share the, um, the question again? Because now I don't remember the, the second part of the question. 
Sure. One moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is it visible? for what concert? Yes. So I ask. Uh, so question by question. First, uh, how long does the cache persist? It depends because the this list is a fixed one. If you don't do any query for two hours, it persists for two hours. But as uh, uh, um, as soon as you have new queries, different queries that run, the older uh, results are discharged. It is shared across all the users. And the role level security is not a problem simply because the storage engine query includes any filter made for the, for the security. So the storage engine is not aware of the security because the formula engine is aware of the security and inject the security there, which means that if two users, different users, have different security profiles, but that particular storage engine query is the same, the cache can reuse it. And so it doesn't matter if the users are of the same role or different, it doesn't matter, it, it just works. So I hope that this uh, yeah, I hope the answer was uh, satisfying for uh, Renato. <laughs> I hope so. Okay, let's go to the next question. One from Mark. In this exam example, we saw DAX that led to too many requests for the storage engine, not that the storage engine was low, I know. What are some best practices to avoid a query that might actually slow down storage engine processing? Wow, uh, this is the entire optimization training because uh, the entire principle of the optimization of a DAX query is to reduce the cost for the storage engine. It could be caused by two different reasons, uh, actually more than, than two, but one is what I shown in the demo. Uh, for some reason, you generate too many storage engine requests. Second, the storage engine is called only one or two times, but it generates a materialization of uh, too much data for the formula engine, which means that the storage engine is slow because it has to create a large uncompressed temporary table in memory and then the uh, formula engine has to spend time reading it. Uh, number three, sometimes the storage engine is not the biggest issue, but the, the formula engine is low for other reasons and that is probably the more complex uh, problem to solve from a certain point of view because at that point there are many, many, many but the best practice to avoid that, well, when we say don't filter columns, don't filter tables, uh, don't create nested iterators, and if you have to do that, put the largest iterator, so the iterator over the largest table uh, below the one that has an iterator over a small table. So if you do the opposite, because only the innermost iterator can be pushed to the storage engine, you have to try to push there the higher cost of scanning a table because otherwise the cardinality that will be consumed by the formal engine is too high and the materialization is too high. So, so if you don't want to learn too much about how the storage engine works, basically uh, avoid, so it's simple, filter columns, don't filter tables, reduce the cardinality of the iterators, avoid nested iterators, and pay attention to context transition. Once you do these four things, 80% uh, of the problems are avoided, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Let's go with uh, one of the questions uh, which came from, uh, from chat from uh, Christy Dragu. Okay. Uh, his first question was, Calculated tables are calculated by the formula engine or the storage engine? The calculated table, uh, this is a, <laughs> okay. In a 
in a model where you import the data and you don't have connections to other data sets or other analysis services databases like a composite model the new composite model where you can connect uh, to other tables okay so if you are creating a calculated table with data that you imported the table is computed at, when you refresh the model and then it's stored in memory how is it executed it depends on the query the query could be executed in part from the former engine, in part from the storage engine. It depends on the on the on the query, but the former engine is always involved. It is just a, how much of the query is solved in the storage engine, how much in the former engine. It's not a question of how many. It's always two engines involved. The question is about uh, how they split the job and how they are optimized. But this affects only the processing time. But if you create a new composite model with a calculated table, then it could be different because depending on the query, the query could be used in the materialized version you have locally on your machine, or it could be sent to the remote data source in order to optimize the execution. And it's a very complex situation in certain conditions, So, but in that case, it could be more complex than that. But I think that if we talk about the formal storage engine, we just have to think about imported data. And so I, I think this is the, the question, yeah, the, the, the answer. OK, thanks. Uh, next one, also from uh, Christy Drago. Yep. Can performance be improved by creating a calculated tables instead of long measures? So can we? Um, we have, this is a, a so in terms of execution, so in terms of usability, if you want to create a model in Power BI where the user navigates into the data, you always have to create some measure, right? So the calculated table could be something that you use to remove part of the calculation in the report and to prepare some data so they don't, they don't have to calculate the same thing over and over. I'll give you an example. Imagine you have a list of transactions, millions of transactions with thousands of accounts. And these transactions are made over time. You could create a measure that computes the uh, cumulative total of the measure since the beginning of the time which is, for example, if you have a bank account, is the amount, the balance amount of the account, is just the, the sum of all the transactions you made in the past for that account. You can. But if you have th thousands of accounts, it could work pretty much good. But if you have hundreds of thousands of accounts, it is probably too slow. So you could offload this calculation by creating another table, a snapshot, that could be created as a calculated table, if you want, that has, for example, for each month, the balance amount. And then the measure could be more complex because it starts from the, the latest uh, end of month, according to the date that you want to query, and then it computes only the transactions between the last balance amount available for that account and the current date reducing the amount of data that you have to to, to, to aggregate to compute the, 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 the balance amount over time. So at that point, yes, the calculator could the calculated table could help, but the calculated it, table itself doesn't solve the problem. You still have to use the calculated table in your measure and potentially creating more complex measures unless you want to just use the calculated table instead of going to the original table with all the transactions. So it really depends, right? So it's 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 not an easy thing, but I would say you it, calculated table is a tool you have to create data that you know you can trust because it is created with the same data that you imported. You can prepare the same table in Power Query or in SQL, but then at that point you have to be careful that if you refresh one table and not another, you could have an inconsistent state of your model. So it's up to you 
to make sure that you have the data aligned. The calculated table gives you only the guarantee that whatever data you have in the original table, the calculated table is always up to date, right? That this is the only guarantee that you have. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, next one, uh, it's from the chat and then we'll take one which yes. came through the form. Okay. Uh, from uh, Jain Pragati, I think. What is the okay. impact on performance when creating summarized or group tables using DAX versus creating same tables in a query editor? Is there any? I'm trying to understand the question. So is, is one of the first questions we received? Yes. Uh, let me check. Just after it depends. What is uh, the impact? Uh, what is it? Uh, I'm not sure because, uh, because the question could be interpreted in different ways. If the question is about what is the difference between uh, doing the same calculation in DAX or in Power Query? When, when you say Query Editor, I assume that mm -hmm. you, we're talking about Power Query. I'm also thinking about uh, this. Then I said it, it depends. But the problem is that if you don't need the detail, you should use Power Query because this way you only import the aggregated table and you have a smaller memory cost for that, right? This is option number one. Option number two, you uh, want to create a snapshot for performance reasons. At that point you can do, you can use both ways, but probably if the table is not too big, I would use um, DAX just because I know that the, the data is synchronized and I don't have inconsistencies in my in my model. At the same time, if the table is very large, a calculated table is very large, uh, I could prefer using the query editor just because this way I have a smaller memory cost for processing the table, not for the query, but for the process. But I mean, it really depends, right? So it is it's not easy to, in general, it depends. I, I, I cannot say this is the way to go, right? These are two tools with different purposes. Uh, maybe uh, Jain can uh, explain it more with an additional one, or uh, you can even unmute and uh, clarify whether it was uh, the in Power Query, or are you referring to the uh, beginning of the uh, summarizing tables when you are loading the data, because this is what's happening when you are using the Power Query or when you are running the measures. So it's different uh, time frames when you are measuring hi, performance. Uh, hi, Marco. Uh, hi. I can actually uh, just, I mean, reiterate my question. So first of all, thank you so much. I mean, I'm really happy to attend this QA session with you. So, so my question was, um, from the point of view, like consider a scenario where I'm dealing with like, suppose I'm I'm dealing with a data set that that has like customer invoices related to the vehicle transactions. Okay, now I'm dealing with like 10 years old data. So like I've got like millions of rows in my data, yes. nearly 15 millions. And now I want to summarize my data at a customer level. Now my original table is at invoice level, but transaction level, but I want to summarize data at customer level. Now, in this scenario, will you suggest me to create a summarize table using DAX summarize function at customer level? Or should I create a customer level table in Power Query? Because I have nearly 3 million unique customers in my data. The question is, where do you consume this data? Because, okay, you want to aggregate the data by customer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you want to export? Because I'm, yeah. yeah, because I'm trying to visualize my data at customer level. OK, but I also need the invoice details at a customer level. Like, for example, if the user want to drill into an individual customer, yep. he should see all the transactions he had yep. in the last 10 years. So I need everything there. OK, so uh, no, no, I now understand. Um, uh, 
even though you will not like this answer, Power BI is not good for doing any kind of report. In particular, when you want to drill down at, at the lowest level of detail, you could, you're looking for troubles. Power BI is designed to work at the aggregated data level. Now, what could happen? The problem is definitely not, I mean, you don't have to aggregate the data by customer. There is no reason to do that, right? Because you can achieve good performance keeping the data at the invest level, no problems, no, or even, even to a bigger detail. A table that has a few hundred million rows is not a big deal in a fact table. The real issue is your customer table. You have three million uh, rows in the customer table, right? Uh, okay, but if, so if I have a large dimension, that could be a bigger issue. Uh, not when you filter one customer, but when you filter a group of two millions of customers, that is that is a problem. So if you don't have this problem, if you don't have to visualize the aggregation of many customers, then keeping the data by customer is fine, and reading, you know, filtering by one customer is good, and it, you should get good performance. The real issue is the user interface of Power BI, which when you create the table that you would like to use for the detail level, you will probably see bad performance. Yes. Because, yeah. I know, but the problem is not DAX, the problem is that the Power BI generates a query that is not optimized for that scenario. Oh. If you go to Excel mm -hmm. and you double click the cell where you have your you know, customer, you will see a result that is the result of the drill through, which is, uh, another expression in DAX, much faster, that in milliseconds will provide you the data that you want. Now, the problem is that I can write the, 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 the DAX query that generates the, the visualization that you want and, and run very fast. And I can control it by using the detail rows property for a measure. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. as of today, this measure is not supported in Power BI, also in the model, it is supported if you change it on Power BI service through the XML endpoint or in Azure Analysis Services. So if you're using Azure Analysis Service or Analysis Services, it's, mm -hmm. you are not in trouble, but you have to use Excel as a user interface. Okay. And you have to use the drill through as a user interface. And unfortunately, you don't have a way to you know, display a menu or customize this in some way. So you have to start from a pivot table and then go. If you look at the... Uh, I, I published, um, let me see if I can show you the link to the video. Um, one second. I published a video, this one. I, I, now I show the screen. Uh, one second. Uh, I shared the screen here. And so this video here, so consuming a DAX query in Excel. In this video, I show you how to create in Excel. I, I can show you the, the point where you basically do this. You, you basically change here. Okay, so let me see if I can show you the, the demo. Okay, here, no. Oh because there is something involved in Excel and, okay, here. Oh, come on, I don't find a point. Oh, here, 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 okay. You see here, I, I have a date, but I could say, I could write there the date and the name of the customer. As soon as I change this, I update this. And, and you will see in the video, it's very, very fast. Okay. Uh, 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 the problem is that I use, this is the way I can control the query, right? But I, I have no way to do that in uh, Power BI. You could do the same using paginated reports. So the moment we have paginated reports visual to display a paginated report within a Power BI page, then we can probably combine the two things also in Power BI. But today, the real issue is not, tr don't even try to optimize it because the problem is that the, the structure of the query generated by Power BI is not working well 
with the with the kind of query you want to do today. OK, so so will you suggest like better to stay with the transaction level data and try to create measures within that table itself rather than creating a new customer table? Yeah, you will not solve the problem with the customer table. Believe me. OK, OK. I mean, it would be a partial solution, but yeah, is is really not the problem. The problem you have is another one. You can try, but you will not see big, big, big difference. The big difference is what what I explain now. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's go to the next question, yep. which uh, we received through the form. Okay. Much. Uh, do you so, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if Power BI? Yes. What if Power BI combine all DAX queries in a report page and sends a single DAX query to the analysis services with several evaluates? Do you think we should have a performance improvement if some common variables should occur before? Uh, yes, in theory, yes, but it doesn't work this way. So, yeah. So the question is the okay. So the question is very technical and very detailed. Um, the idea is the following. You have seen that the uh, so let let me share the screen so I explain at least we we do something that is more meaningful to other people. So here, when I use this tool, the performance analyzer, and I hit the refresh button in this page where I have a lot of visuals, we, I explained in the video that one of the reasons why this is slow is because uh, we have many storage engine queries, uh, sorry, many DAX queries. And every DAX query is a different round trip between the report engine and the formula engine. In theory, it is possible to collapse different queries within the same uh, request so even though we still have many, many queries, but these queries will be sent in a single request in a way reducing the overhead of uh, having too many requests, right? So part of the slowness will be solved by using this technique, but only part of that, because internally the engine should still execute different queries with a limited advantage for certain uh, uh, optimizations and the on the report side it would be very very complex uh, to to manage that because the consequence of that is is that you will not see any number until all the numbers are ready so power bi works in a way that you start to see something if if one visual is slow you see all the other data with the with the approach described in the question the result you would obtain is that you will see no data until all the numbers are available. And probably this is also something that many people will not like. So, um, it, no, I, I think is it is technically something that they could do, but it's a completely different architecture. I don't think they will ever do that. And if they do that, we, many people will complain for the opposite reason, unfortunately. Great. A uh, question which is not directly related to, yep. to the video here, but uh, I think everybody expects an answer on it. When does Saturday DAX quiz come back? It was a it was great being wrong almost every single time. This is from uh, Adrian Christian. Ah, the <laughs> the ah, weekly quizzes. Yeah, I know, I know, I don't know. Uh, Maybe in a few months. I don't know. Now we have several uh, unplugged videos, and I think for a while, for other few months, we will continue producing these videos and preparing the the the. It was the the Dax puzzle, right? The Dax puzzle is is an interesting idea, but it it's hard to create every week something different. And by the way, the time required to prepare the question. Uh, is <laughs> it takes time because first of all we you need the idea then you have to you know prepare something that could be condensed in a single tweet in a single picture 
uh, without any data that you have to download is, is not always easy. So, and so in part we ran out of ideas, then we had also the need of having a space for these other videos. So we said, okay, we, we parked that, we, we are accumulating ideas, but we don't have many, so. Uh, but anyway, thanks for the great. feedback, thanks for the feedback. <laughs> yeah, another question from the chat. Uh, yeah. From uh, Costin Daniel. If I had a long SQL query, which references an, another table to filter the results down as a subquery, is it better to run the query like that or add both tables in Power BI? Um, but is this for direct query or for importing the data? Because if I have to import the data, um, what I should do, I should try to create in Power BI the best data model for the report, which means that it doesn't matter how many tables I have to import, I have to do the transformation to have a star schema or several star schemas with shared dimensions. When I am forced not to do that, I know that I'm going to pay a price in performance and in other problems. One of the reasons why I could not do too many transformations is because I will, I have to use direct query, even though it is not ideal. But at that point, it's, uh, it's probably better not to have a too complex query in SQL. Because you, I mean, it depends. It depends on the final performance. But I'm not a big fan of direct query. Most of the times people use direct query for the very wrong reasons. When you really need the power, power query, probably you don't want to create too complex structures in uh, Power BI because at the end of the, 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 the performance could be, could be worse. So as usual, it depends, right? It depends, but for importing the data, do the right model. Don't, don't, don't think about uh, how the query run in, in SQL. Think about, do you have the right model in, in, uh, in Power BI or not? This is the important question. Okay, thank you. Next one from uh, Florin Cimpoieru. If we have multiple fact, uh, facts data files, five, six, yes. with sales okay. cost quality, having more or less the same structure, time, product, customer value, do you recommend to have one fact table with a simple star schema, uh, all or multiple tables? So, if you had other products, you would be forced to have a single fact table. Because we have uh, Power BI and we have uh, more freedom, we can use uh, what is the right thing to do. And the right thing to do depends on the granularity of the data that you have. Let me explain. You mentioned you have the targets. I think, I suppose, that the, the granularity of the target you have is not the same of the sales. Probably you have uh, the sales at the day level and the target at the month level, just to make an example. Now, I want to keep the granularity of the data that I want to express in my report. So if I always show data at the month level, it's fine to aggregate data at the month level and to keep the data at the month level. But you know that you're losing the ability to go at, in the detail at the day level, right? If, if this is what you want, you also save memory doing that. You import a smaller amount of data that you already aggregate at the granularity you want, that's fine. The opposite is very wrong. The opposite is in the same table, I load the day level and at the last day of the month, the target. Don't do that. Because for the time you can still understand, but when it comes to other tables, what do you do for the product? You have the target for the product category, but you don't have the target for the product, but you have the sales for the product. Then how do you manage that? It's much easier 
to keep the, the tables at the, at the right granularity. So if I have the table targets that has one row for each category and month, I keep that. Then I have the sales that have the product and the day. Then I have the day table and the product table that are connected to both at different granularity. You have the many-to-many -many cardinality relationship that can be used to connect a dimension to a fact table with a different granularity. It just works. Just pay attention. Single direction filter, the default is bidirectional, is very bad. We have a video on SQL BI channel on YouTube about budget with uh, Power BI, budgeting with Power BI, where we face exactly this problem. And you can see that we, we, we keep two different fact tables. Sales, cost, quantity, cash. Uh, I will analyze. I, I, so maybe that you can put in a single table several data because actually it is the same data. But if they are different events happening at different time in different places with different granularities, it, I, I don't see any problem in keeping different tables. I'm just surprised to see the quantity because the quantity is an attribute of the sales or of the purchases so for me sales is a measure for something that i'm selling the cost if the cost is a, a measure is an information i can have for a single transaction it's just another measure in the same table the quantity the same uh, but cash is probably the payment of an invoice that probably has a different date so it, it is probably in a different table right so in the description that you provided me, I see three fact tables, not one, not five, right? So, but but I may be wrong. So it, it depends on the model. But I think that the idea is that you have to keep the the, the data modeling right. Uh, and, and multiple fact tables are not bad if you have different granularities for your facts, and you have different facts, by the way. The speaking of granularity, probably it's related with the next questions also from yep. uh, Florin. If we have data at monthly level, do you recommend using the time intelligence? Uh, yes, but it, it depends. It depends on what we mean by time intelligence. Let me show you one second. I prepare here. Uh, 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 uh. So I share my screen. And here we have this. In DAX patterns, we have uh, a section about time intelligence, which has several different patterns. So we have four patterns for the time. One of those four patterns is just for, so the first one is standard time related calculation. So if you want to use the standard DAX time intelligence functions, this is for you. If you have data at the month level only, then there is a better way to do this, which is the month related calculations, which is a pattern where we use other formulas, not the ones that you use with the DAX time intelligence functions. Why? Because they are faster and they are more flexible. If you have only, remember, this is not just you have data at the month level. The idea is that if you don't care about the day granularity, even though you have data at the day level, but you only want to do calculation at the month level, it is better to use this pattern. And in this pattern, we simply have DAX formulas for all the calculations. So for example, uh, you want to get the year to date, and here we go. So this is the, the, the year to date. Right, and it's it's a simple calculation, right? It's it's not that difficult. This is the entire measure, and th this is a copy and paste that you can do in all your measures, or you could create a calculation group with uh, replacing the sales amount with selected measure, for example. So, and this only only works with the month level, of course. Uh, but but it is much faster because you in, internally the DAX time intelligence calculation forces the storage engine to provide the temporary table at the day level or internally the storage engine has to filter by day which is not the best thing you can do if you want to work at the month level you could say storage engine give me the data at the month level i don't care about the the days and this reduces by 30 the size of the 
cache and the movement of data between storage engine and former engine, you can improve the performance a lot, especially if you have direct query. In this case, it's much faster too. Great. Thank you. I hope uh, the answer satisfies Florin. Uh, next one. Let's have one which came through the form. Yep. And, uh, let me show the screen. One from Renato again. Yep. Uh, how can I evaluate the performance of a role uh, for role with role level security enabled? I was able to connect Dex Studio in a role to query, but I couldn't enable the server timings. Uh, it should work. Um, if you are I, I, now I don't remember exactly, and I, I don't have an example to test, but when you connect, so you, you have to be an administrator in order to enable the server timing. It's an administrator of the remote server. So you are probably connecting to analysis services or to Power BI service. The question was about Power BI service or about, uh, I don't remember. Uh, the question again, let's- It does, uh, doesn't it, talk about Power BI, right? No. Okay, so um, there are there were limitations, but I think that the latest version of Duck Studio connected to connected as an administrator should work. You can see the message here. Yeah, Renato is saying on the chat that uh, it's about. Power power ah, in Power BI Desktop. Okay, in Power BI Desktop, in Power BI Desktop, it should work. If you connect the role in the connection string, it should work. So I don't know, but, uh, I, I don't remember exactly. There was a limitation in that, but there was a way to work around on it. And I don't remember exactly. In theory, it should work. I suggest you, because this is a question about DAX Studio, go on GitHub uh, in the DAX Studio issues area and post the question there because Darren and I will, will reply. And before doing that, check that the question doesn't have already an answer because maybe that someone else already asked the same. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Next one from uh, Roy Coelia. When we are doing SSIS cubes on premises with live connection to Power BI service and the performance is really slow, how do we manage the lag? It's a problem because uh, the, the so let me let me explain. Um, I can show my screen and I can clear this. So you have this situation. You have analysis services. Uh, your analysis services AS is here on-prem then you have a, a gateway here okay and the gateway connects this to the cloud where you have a power bi the service then you have a client which could be could be a browser here so you have your browser and you and you have a chart here this generates a DAX query. The DAX query is sent here. The DAX query generates request here. And then the data comes, go back this way. Uh, it's more complex than that, but you get the idea. So when you, even though you are in the same network of your analysis services, it doesn't matter. You always go back and forth between Power BI, which means that if you have a latency here of one second here and one second here, guess what? It's uh, almost four seconds. So 100 milliseconds is 400 milliseconds for each query. So what can I say? Reduce the number of visuals because uh, every visual has the same latency. and uh, the, the, Or try to improve the performance or check where the Power BI tenant is um, here is, is, is allocated. Imagine that a company has the headquarter in the United States 
and they have this in United States and you have this in, I don't know, Australia. Okay, we have a problem. We have a problem because the, the, the latency is probably 500 milliseconds or something like that. Maybe 300, 400. Um, you, you, so what can you do? Or you either move this or this. Uh, one thing you could do is to move this into the cloud in the same region. But of course, it's no longer on, on, on premises. I understand that. Uh, otherwise, remove this and use uh, Power BI here. If you use Power BI uh, report server, then you have everything on premises and the latency is much better. But when you use the gateway, you have to, you, you need a very, 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 very fast connection with a very, very, very low latency. I, 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 we don't have any magic solution here. <laughs> there is no magic anywhere. No. You no, were talking. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's the physics. No, no, it's, it's the, the, the physics. Uh, <laughs> it's not a, a low that we can change, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were talking in the video and also here, you just said that uh, one of the solutions is to reduce the number of visuals. But uh, is it's a question from me now. Uh, yep. Is, is there any difference between using uh, standard uh, Power BI visuals that uh, are coming with the Power BI desktop uh, versus using custom visuals? For the latency, no, but the custom visual has usually a higher execution cost for a number of reasons. So the, the libraries that are used, the problem is the following. The custom visual has to run in a sandbox for security reasons, and this has a cost. Uh, it is not very high, but is there, which means that let's say, imagine you have a tax of 100, 200 milliseconds just because you're using a custom visual, right? No matter what you do, you have this tax to pay. So Extra costs. If, you think, if you think about this, first, you don't want to create too many custom visuals in a page. I mean, you don't want to create too many custom, too many visuals in a page, but especially you don't want too many custom visuals in a page. And this is one of the reasons that uh, drove us in creating the car with states with the multiple cards, because we reduce the number of queries and we reduce the number of visuals, right? So it's it's uh, it's more efficient and you know it's it's just faster. And the custom visual also has an additional layer on top of the native visuals, and this also means that it does it cannot do everything. So the cost for the single communication is not that high, but the cost is the limitation in features that you have in the custom visuals. Um, but besides, I mean, the, the the custom visual. If you have a good reason for using a custom visual, it's fine and. The custom visual sometimes is a solution, not a problem, right? Mm -hmm. You create a problem if you want to test all the custom, all the strange custom visuals, or you create a visual that you could have obtained with a native visual, but you use a custom visual just because you want that particular effect that you don't have in the native visual. That's not a good reason, in my opinion. So you should try to use the native visual if you don't need, but if you need a custom visual, and you have a good justification for using custom visual, why not? Just not create too many. Okay, thank you. Uh, a short question now. Yep. Do variables have any performance impact? Is there uh, too many variables in a DEX formula? No. The, the variable itself, no. The, the Usually the variable is a way to make your code run faster. But of course, you can use the variable in a way that you run your code slower. Of course. They're, 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 so, but if used the, as they should be used, they are not a problem. Okay, thank you. Next one, from uh, Daniel Costin. Uh, yep. I see it's eight o'clock already. Uh, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> can we stay a bit more? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, if I wanted to create a snapshot table which shows what 
the data was before the report refreshes. For example, if I had 1000 customers and on refresh, I have 1100. Yeah. The table would say refresh date 1000, refresh date 1100. This is not something you can do within Power BI. You have to do this outside of Power BI. Because uh, the only way to obtain what you're saying is to... I mean, yeah, it's always... It depends on the Power Query transformation that you create. One thing you could do, you create... Um, you create a data source where you get whatever you get plus the date of the refresh, the refresh date. And if you use the incremental refresh using this technique and you use that date in the incremental refresh, you could obtain, and, and you use the day as a granularity of the partition of the incremental refresh, what happens is that every day you add data to the table. It could work. But the first time you have to deploy a new version of your Power BI model, you lose the entire history. So my suggestion, if you really need this information, create something outside of Power BI to keep history of your data, because Power BI is not designed for that. Great. Next one yep. from uh, Adi Christian. Okay. Assuming all are available and cost is not an issue, but seeing the data as close to live as possible is, is important. Yeah. Which would you uh, choose between import from SQL, direct query to SQL, or analysis services? Very same model, less than 50,000 rows in total. Well, for, for 50,000 rows, you can afford using direct query. So, okay, import from SQL and analysis services, we are talking about the same thing, right? So the difference is, do you want to import data in analysis services or in Power BI, or do you want to use direct query? Uh, and if you really have only 50,000 rows, probably direct query is good, it's good enough, because the, the, the performance could be good. Um, there is another option that I that we will. Uh, I mean, now I, I can just mention, but in a few weeks we should produce some tool, and I'm working on a tool and some more um, explanation of how to use it. Uh, a push data set is a data set that technically is like you import data, but you push new data into the the, the data set without a full refresh. And this also update in real time a dashboard with a tile that has data coming from a push data set. Um, now, the push data set has an API to create a model that has all many of the features that you have in a regular model. Even though 99% of the models that I have seen so far in the push data set have only one table, but actually you don't have this limitation. What is the problem? You don't have tools to design a model this way and yeah. so we're working on some tool to help you creating a model starting from an existing Power BI model and to populate the model with an initial data set and just sending the, 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 the updates so in a few weeks we will see that available and it will be also a github open source project so but 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 I don't think it's required in this case because you have a small amount of data so for a small amount of data unless you have a problem of scalability because using that query you create a workload on sql server but you said that you don't have a problem of cost so just uh, throw date throw money on sql server and it's fine is this tool uh, related in any way with the dex do and the possibility no, to upload no, your no. own uh, data sets no 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 it's a completely different thing uh, it was only a curiosity because no, I know no, no. that uh, yeah. this uh, disappeared. This question appeared whether we could switch the data model behind the Dex do and uh, no, run but, your own. No, but it, no, you cannot. And the problem is that you are uh, Dex do can work thanks to a service that has uh, access to your database. This service mm. is not managed by you, and so. 
assuming that someone would do that, we will not, but imagine that tomorrow we will do this and we enable you to provide, so you should provide us the credentials to access to your data source. And you have to trust us that we don't use those credentials to do something else. Yeah, I saw your video so, explaining how it works. And yeah. uh, I was uh, <laughs> thinking that maybe you, you found a way to, to work around it, you said in a few months. That you are working on something. No, uh, no, 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 no. We are working on other things. No, this one, no, no, no. This very is good. out of the question. There are parts of the technologies we developed in DAX2. We will use them for other purposes, possibly, but not this one. Not this Looking one. forward to see what you are preparing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, one more uh, from uh, Sandhya Soman. Suppose I want to migrate a report in ClickView to Power BI. Can I recreate the report in Power BI with the same data model as that of Click? Will it have any uh, performance impact if we use the same data model in Power BI? Or do we need to uh, do some data modeling specific to Power BI? What would be the recommended approach for this scenario? So generally speaking, I'm, I'm not an expert of ClickView, so this is important. But for what I know of ClickView, there shouldn't be features in ClickView that you cannot uh, replicate in Power BI, especially the data model. Data model in Power BI should be much more powerful. But I cannot say for sure it wor it will work because I don't know the many things you can do in ClickView, how they translate to Power BI. It, generally speaking, yes, you can, but how to transform certain uh, things that you do in the script in ClickView to Power BI, it could be not so a linear process. In general, yes, but it, it depends on many details. And the performance really, I, I usually Power BI is faster. The engine is faster, but again, if we do, you might have a specific model that does something that is not faster on on Power BI and has to be to be adapted. So it really depends. I, I don't think there is a universal way to answer to the question. It really depends on your model and your calculations. Uh, there are two more questions. Yep. Maybe we can uh, clear them and uh, okay. wrap up afterwards. One from Renato, another one yep. from Renato. Uh, yep. I see Renato was very curious <laughs> and uh, I'm glad that uh, yeah. we had this session. In terms of performance, which is better? A, to have a fact table with uh, X columns with numeric values, uh, one for one each KPI, for each, yeah. the yeah. column name, to have one column for the value and other for the KPI name. In the in sales example, we have X in a range of two five, all use case A. But if we have X equal thirty, I don't the number of actually. Columns. I don't understand the ah the number of columns. Mm. But I don't understand. We have X in a range. What is X? Ah, X column. The number of columns uh, use case A. Uh, so the problem is, it's not easy to answer to this question because it assumes that there is a good way and a bad way. And the problem is that it depends on the report. Because if you always Let's say this. If you create a matrix where you always display all the KPIs, one for each column, and you have a single measure, so the KPI is a filter and you have one measure, um, it could be better the solution B, even though 
90% of the times A is better. So if I should if I if I should provide an answer in 10 seconds, I would say A. But I know that in certain conditions for certain reports, B will be faster. So it depends, right? So figure out what. So if you have to create a model without knowing what the user will do, probably A is a safer solution, even though you have 30 columns. Uh, but the assumption is that the user don't use all the columns all the times. Because if the users use all the columns all the times, then it depends on how you generate the query and it depends on many other things. And one of the problems could be that if you have 30 columns, you have 30 measures. And if you have 30 measures, the current engine could not create the optimal. It, it, it depends on other things, but you, you should test both at that point. 90% of the times, A is better. But there are cases where B could be better. It, it depends. It's always it depends, right? <laughs> depends on the use cases. B is more expensive. B is definitely more expensive when you populate the table when you because you could duplicate more data. You, at the end of the day, in B, you duplicate more data. All the keys for all the dimensions are duplicated. So it's uh, at the end you have a bigger table for mm -hmm. sure. So it costs more in memory and in processing. But at query time, there could be cases where B performs better for a number of reasons. Remember, it's it's complex because we have to analyze also the server, the server capacity, the number of cores. And so there are a number of things to to evaluate. But usually, A is better. Usually. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, the last question from the chat. Yep. Okay. Uh, from uh, Florin Cimpoieru. How can a very long switch be improved? Many 50 KPIs with different format rules of aggregation. Would a split in two thirds visualization help or the opposite? Uh, I understand that you use the switch to change the value you display in a measure. So a long switch. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. The pro, the, there are different. So Microsoft already optimized the switch statement so that if you write a switch in a certain way, making sure that you have um, a simple. Okay, the switch should have a constant value or a very simple predicate, and the measure that you have in the switch is uh, simple relatively simple or you don't have I mean yeah so in simple conditions even though the switch is long it is well it is relatively well optimized the problem is what happens if you have nested switches because when you have a measure for managing one slicer then another measure to managing another slicer and so on and so you combine them together if you think about what you're doing you have many nested switch statements at that point, having a single one could be better. It's counterintuitive, but the single switch could not be the problem. The problem could be that you have another switch with just two switches that is called before of that, right? And then could harder performance more than what you think. Another possibility is looking at the calculation groups and the calculation items, even though it is not a magic solution if you have this kind of problem. But it, it is certainly a, a solution for the for a different format problems because a part of the calculation group definition could be for each calculation item you have the format string that could be dynamic and the uh, evaluation of the value. Unfortunately, the calculation groups not always have the best performance and they could have the same problem, if not worse, of the switch. So. Um, if you say with with a split in two three visualization, you mean if I have different measures for different purposes, yes, this helps. But again, it's important that you don't create a, simply a, a split between two three different measures, and then you create a, a measure in the top that does another switch. So if you started to to create nested switches, is not the solution. You you are just going to worse the problem. Um, and yeah, 
in theory, so for the format, it would be better to use the calculation groups also for the rules of aggregations, but it depends. And it's it's very model specific. Uh, again, um, without a, an example, it's hard to to provide a clear direction, and it could be ma many things. I know. Sorry. Yeah, and, and that's a good answer. Of, <laughs> speaking of calculation groups, we just yep. received another question on yep. uh, on the forms, and uh, this is really the last one. Okay. Are calculation groups faster or slower than regular measures? Uh, for a time intelligence set of measures, for example, you are replacing uh, three, four, five uh, uh, measures with a calculation group. Is it working they faster are or not, slow? Okay, that's a good question. They are not faster today. They okay. The the best case scenario, they have the same performance. And the advantage of the calculation group in that scenario is that you reduce the number of measures you have to write and duplicate. But in terms of performance, you will not see a performance improvement because the way it works today, it transforms the measure. So at the end, you execute the same code, uh, which is counterintuitive. If I have the same measure, sorry, if I have the same transformation for four measures, the filter created in the, in, the, in, the, in the time intelligence evaluation should be applied to four measures. And actually, this is probably what happens because the formula, the, the query plan realizes that the same filter is applied to several measures and probably this is what happens, but it's not guaranteed to happen. I understand that. So as of today, calculation groups could be better compared to a solution where you use the switch statement, not in a particular good way. Even though if you write the switch statement following a few best practices, so just one switch, high level, simple condition, very simple condition, no statement before the switch, no other switch nested, the engine already excludes the branches that are not executed. But as I said, is is fragile. As soon as you have something more, the engine doesn't know and expand the query plan, computing everything. And at the point, you have a very bad performance. So in this, from this point of view, I would say that it's easier to manage the calculation groups, obtaining good performance. Even though technically, I have to say they are the same. So if you write the same, if you write an equivalent code in DAX, you will see the same performance today. This could change in the future, by the way. So I would use the calculation group just because in the future it could be better. Thank you. Okay. So we arrived at the end of the question sets and uh, thank you again for uh, joining us and sharing your knowledge with, uh, with us. You're welcome. It, uh, You're it was a great session. I've learned a lot. And uh, thank you very much. If, if you are doing it again with uh, other uh, meetups, uh, I'd like to join. So okay, uh, okay. I'll uh, I, just uh, uh, keep yeah, yeah. the eyes open and uh, <laughs> see okay, okay, okay. If you are answering uh, yeah. for the participants, uh, thank you all for joining and uh, thank you, thank you. Stay everyone. tuned for the um, form with whatever you want to see next uh, on the 29th of uh, April with Matt Ellington. Thank you, Marco. Thank, yeah. Chris. Thank you again, Marco. Thank you, Gil. Thank uh, you, Christian. See you next nice time. evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, bye -bye. See you next you. time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.